This lecture will cover Chapter 6 in the textbook, which is Exploring for Exceptions, Building on Client Strengths and Successes. So we will delve into further uh, elements of the solution building process and how we use exceptions and scaling to help in this uh, collaboration with our clients. So let's get started. So exceptions, they, it is defined as those past experience in a client's life when the problem might reasonably have been expected, but somehow it didn't. So those uh, miracle moments when, let's say, it, the client should have had that issue or should have had that reaction or should have had that bad experience, and it didn't happen. This is what it means when we're seeking exceptions in our clients' lives. They are there. Sometimes they are there on a smaller scale. Sometimes they are there on a larger scale. And sometimes our clients are aware of them and sometimes they're not until we've explored and so that's why we seek to find those exceptions that are happening in our clients lives so we find out from our client whether or not first of all they're aware of any of these exceptions that may have happened in the recent past and so once they have identified let's say they say well yeah I guess two weeks ago there was this one moment where I realized that I was able to keep my calm and instead of me flying off the handle like I usually do I was able to just pull away from the situation and I went and I exercised and I felt a lot better and that was a good um, way for me to handle my anger so once they've identified it it's your job as a practitioner for you to figure out, okay, what are the details of this exception? What's different about this exception compared to the problem times? And this is where we use the who, the what, the when, the where for exceptions. We don't use the who, what, when, where for problems per se, but we do delve into that who, what, where, when talk when it comes to exceptions because we want to know everything that has happened that has surrounded this circumstance and this is lovely exception because that's where we know those solutions can spring from. If a good moment happened two weeks ago, we want to know all the things that contributed to that good moment because that means that there's hope that that good moment could happen again. And the more that our clients are aware of the positive things, the contributing factors that help those exceptions to become possible, the more likely they are to actually be able to do them themselves. And that's where the solution building creation process really takes off. So throughout this time while we're asking about exceptions, while their clients identifying exceptions, you're using those foundational skills we learned several chapters back, paraphrasing, summarizing, and we're grounding the differences between exception and problem times for the client. So when your client's telling you that they were able to remain calm, they went and exercised, and they took some time away, and that was helpful to them, and this is what they realized was an exception moment, paraphrase those pieces. So pulling away and exercising was helpful. So that was something that helped you behave in a more positive manner than what you usually may have reacted to, huh? Those kind of basic skills help to bring it back to the client and it also helps them to then elaborate further if they would like. Sometimes it also helps them realize, wow, there is a difference here between this exception moment and the problem that I've been describing up to this point in our session. So highlight those client strengths that you are pulling. When we hear exceptions, it is abundantly full of strengths that the client has. If the client tells you that instead of them losing their cool and losing their temper, they exercise and they pull away from the situation like the sample scenario I've been um, discussing, then that's a strength that the client was able to A, realize and be self-aware that they were possibly getting to that point where they would lose their temper, B, being able to not only realize it but take action and to actually make a different type of action that was a positive choice for their circumstance. So as you are hearing exceptions from your clients, start to filter through and highlight those strengths. Rephrase, paraphrase them back to the client, compliment and say, wow, I'm just impressed that even in the midst of that moment where usually you could have gone one way or another, that you were able to take a moment, pause, and mentally think about a different choice and make that choice and then actually follow through with that. That takes a lot of strength to be able to change our behaviors, especially in the moment when things are the hardest to change. So make sure that you're highlighting those strengths. And then 
as we always do, respect your client's words and their frame of reference, so what they give to you. Sometimes your clients will be able to abundantly share exceptions with you, and sometimes they're going to say no, that there's nothing that they can think of that's gone even just a little bit better. And that's where we continue to support their, their frame of reference while trying to explore and see if maybe there's something that may have been missed. And so we, we continue to move in that process to further understand the client's situation. So an example of exceptions, this is an exception question. Has there been a time in the last couple of weeks when the problem didn't happen, or maybe it was less severe? Remember, sometimes your client will not be able to think of a time where the client was where the problem was completely gone, but they might be able to think of a time where the problem was just a little bit better. And we focus on those moments when it's just a little bit better. We hone in on that, and that's what we amplify, we magnify those small little victories along the way. Because their clients sometimes are so downtrodden that it's hard for them to see the little victories that they are accomplishing. And so we pull up the magnifying glass and try to let them see that that little bit of hope, that little bit of improvement is a sign. And we want to go ahead and further understand what happened to make that improvement. Another way to ask is using relationship type questions. So suppose I asked your spouse if you had any better days recently, what would he say? And so getting an angle from one of those important people that we've already discovered matter to your client and then asking that perspective on those exceptions. And make sure that just like with the miracle question and any of the other skills that you're learning in this course, once you find some information out, don't just drop it and leave it there at face value on the table. We want to pull it and be able to understand and unpack it a little bit more. So don't push for closure once the client mentions the first exception. So if they say, yes, well, two weeks ago, I was able to maintain my cool and I um, was able to exercise and pull away from the situation and then I was able to regroup and then think clearer about the circumstance versus losing my temper. If you were to leave it at that and say that's great and you move on into the interview without further exploring you might miss other exceptions. You might miss other opportunities to understand what was going on so that the client can also understand what was going on. Through processing through your questions and through your dialogue it will help bring to aware you Bring to your client the awareness level as far as what made those exceptions possible. So don't be quick to just say, that's great, and move on. Keep digging and find out. So when you took when you took that 20-minute walk and you exercise just for the sake of clearing your head, what was that like for you? What about that made it helpful for you? What, what about it made it so that you decided to even do that? How did you realize that this was going to be a, a way of handling the circumstance? So keep digging. There are two types of exceptions. There's deliberate and there's random exceptions. Remember, when we're looking for exceptions, regardless, we want to know the how of the exception. Who did what to make it happen? And so when we're looking at deliberate exceptions, this is when your client tells you, yes, there was a moment two weeks ago when I was so frustrated and I was this close to losing my temper, but I, I thought about it, I paused, and I went outside and I took a walk and just got some exercise to clear my head. That client is able to identify their role, that they made that choice, they took the pause, they chose to go take a walk instead, and they're part of that exception. And they see themselves as an active part because they did a specific action or a specific thought or a mix of the two to make it happen. So that's what a deliberate exception is. It's just like when you deliberately intend to do something, you, they deliberately were part of that exception process. Random exceptions are when the client may not identify themselves as part of that process. So maybe they say, I have no idea. It just, I just cooled off and I have no idea what made that happen. Or if it relates to a loved one, I have no idea what made him respond in a more positive way to me. It just happened. Maybe it was a miracle. Maybe it was a stroke of good luck. When a client sees the exception as something that they weren't actively in part of, when they weren't um, making a concentrated effort or that they can see that they did a specific action, then that's considered a random exception. So know the difference between deliberate exceptions and random exceptions because this will help you when you go to formulate feedback. In the next chapter, we're going to dive into formulating feedback to our clients. And it's going to help you when you know the difference if they see themselves as an active player in the, de in the deliberate exception process or if they see exceptions as just a fluke of nature 
this random miracle moment, and it was not something that they were uh, deliberately involved in. So know the difference between those two. Scaling questions is another great skill, and I think aside from the miracle question, I personally find such great use in the scaling question because there's so much you can do with it, and there's so many different angles you can take on the scaling question. So scaling questions are questions that invite your client to put into their observations, impressions, and predictions on a scale from 0 to 10. So you have that established scale, and it, what it does is that it helps the client to be able to look at their life and be able to describe certain events of their life in a more concrete and accessible manner so that you and the client can understand it more tangibly. So for example, um, as we're looking through, you want to cite a specific time in the client's life. So maybe you're scaling something about how they feel today or how they have felt in the past week or for the next week. So whether it's future or past oriented or present oriented, make sure that you kind of bookend it with the time. Make sure to describe what 0 and 10 mean on the scale. So often I've seen students that say, okay, well on a scale of 0 to 10, how confident are you that you can make this, um, that you can solve this problem? Now, the problem there is the student didn't clarify what 0 and 10 meant. And so the client might think that 0 is 0 good or 0 bad. And what do they mean in respect to the scale? So make sure you're very clear. So it's on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 may mean that you have no confidence at all. And 10 means that you have all of the confidence in the world. Where on that scale would you place yourself when it comes to your confidence in being able to uh, solve this problem? So notice how I described what they mean so that the client is very clear. Like I said, scaling questions are wonderful because they are so versatile. You have the ability to scale a client's feelings, their self-esteem, um, pre-session change, in other words, what they where they were in their feelings towards a circumstance or how they felt that they were handling the problem before they came to see you and now that they saw you in the first session how they feel um, their confidence level how invested they are to change how willing they are to work hard this helps you know if you have a client that's saying I want change but they're not willing to work harder they're not really motivated to work hard then that helps you keep that in perspective so you can respect their frame of reference and their perception. That's going to look very different from a client who's highly motivated to work as hard as it may take to solve the problem. Uh, prioritizing their problem, their perceptions, and then even evaluating progress where they can look back and say, where I am, to, where am I today on this scale? Where was I a week ago or two weeks ago? And those are uh, different ways and there are many other ways aside from just these that are mentioned that you can use scaling questions for. And then once your client answers the scaling question, explore what that number means. Uh, you know, where would they like to be instead? And then what would be different? So for example, going back to the confidence question, if, my, if I ask my client on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 means no confidence at all, 10 means all the confidence in the world, how confident are you that you can solve this problem? Let's say my client says a 7. I can easily react and say, wow, a 7, that, that's pretty high on that scale. So what about that makes it a 7 for you? What tells you that you're at a 7? And the reason why I want you to explore further about the number itself is that a 7 for me might be pretty good, but maybe not the top, whereas for your client, a 7 might be right where they are really hoping to be. Or it might be that what you imagine a 7 to mean might be very different from your client's perception. Remember, we want to come from the posture of not knowing. So explore what the seven looks like. And if my client says, well, I woke up this morning and I feel like I can um, start making a plan. And just the fact that I'm here talking with you today lets me know that I can actually make some changes and I need to just get to them and I need to maybe make lists. So I feel pretty confident that I can make this happen. So that's what a seven would look like. Now, another follow-up question that you'll get to at some point um, will be to ask where the client wants to be. You know, maybe they say it's a 7, but maybe instead of a 7, they'd rather be at a 9 or at an 8. Or maybe they say, well, actually, this is exactly where I want to be. So find out where the client wants to be in that scale compared to where they are in that moment. And then that will help you understand and ask the next question, which is, so if you're at a 7 today and you say you want to be at a 9, and that's your goal for our counseling, and we're going to get into this in later chapters, so I won't go too far into this piece, but... As a, as a snapshot, this is where you're going to head with this um, skill. 
then you can then ask, so what would a 9 look like compared to the 7? What would be different between the 7 and the 9? And this helps you to then operationalize those behaviors, those skills, those thoughts that your client needs to have different, and it helps with the goal formulation process for later sessions. So as you can see, there's lots of levels that you can use a scaling question. And so don't just take the number at face value and drop it and leave it. Find out what it means, where would they like to be, and what would be different once that happens. And you can also use the miracle scale, where instead of zero meaning something and ten meaning uh, you know, that it's a good piece, use the miracle question that you just asked. And since you had all those details and you painted that canvas in vibrant colors, you can say where zero means that uh, you have no hope at all for being able to accomplish this. And 10 is that miracle day that you described. It is that good. You have every single thing that you mentioned is a 10. Where are you? And this allows you to also get another angle using a scaling question. So an example, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 means no chance, 10 means every chance, what do you think the chances are that sometime in the next week your son will listen to your directions the first time that you ask? That's one way to ask a scaling question. Another way is on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is no motivation at all, and 10 is you're completely motivated. How motivated are you to find a solution for this problem? So again, describing what 0 and 10 mean, making sure it matches. So in other words, it can be very confusing for a client if you say, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is like no motivation, and 10 is you think that there's every chance in the world, um, how confident are you? Now notice all of those pieces don't match. Zero with no motivation, 10 being confident, and then I'm asking something completely different at the end of that question. So make sure your zero and your 10 on your scale match with what your next question is. So if you notice on these questions, zero is no motivation, 10 is completely motivated, and then I'm asking how motivated they're going to be to find the solution. So make sure those tenses and those um, descriptors match each other. Otherwise, you could be asking really three different kinds of questions in one question, which would be very confusing for your client, and it also will make your information less accurate because they might be answering one piece of it that you really aren't intending them to answer. So just make sure that you've described 0 to 10 and that you've also made sure that your descriptors for what 0 means, 10 means, and what your question is all match. So the progression. I want to take a step back and look at the big picture again since we've been diving into things like the miracle question and then the exceptions and scaling. This is a step back. This is in the back of your textbook. They have a whole wonderful appendix that I encourage you to look at early because there are protocols for various stages in the solution building process. Some of them include other questions to ask and so if you find yourself stuck or maybe you find yourself still a bit puzzled on how this all comes together, those protocols in the back of your textbook are really helpful to break it down in a different way and make it more step-by-step -step oriented. Of course, with individuals, things might not be sequential all the time. Oftentimes we go in a fairly loose sequence and then we might come back around and have to revisit certain things and alter other things. But in general, this gives you a snapshot of the progression of where we're going. So starting way back in the beginning, when you first meet that client, role clarification, you start the session, name, small talk, etc. Then you're going to move into problem description so you can understand how can I be useful to you or what is the reason why you came in today or how is this a problem for you, what have you tried. All of those types of questions are seeking for your understanding to match the client's uh, description of their problem. And then you move into goal formulation. And I realized that I forgot that these are animated with some color. So here we go, never caught up. Now you move into goal formulation where you're wanting to ask what the client wants instead and what they have to be, what would have to be different as a result of them meeting with you so that they feel like your t their time was worthwhile or what they were hoping to gain. All of those types of questions are angled towards future um, and goal type of pieces to the, the solution building process. And then you move into the miracle question where you can then elaborate further on what that miracle day looks like along with all the follow-up questions that will help you really paint that canvas clearly. And then we're really moving and grooving towards a solution now. And so exceptions where you're trying to find out when those pieces of the miracle day have already happened or when maybe the problem wasn't as severe. And then scaling where you're scaling for confidence and progress and whatever else you feel would be a helpful tool for you to understand where the client is and what you need to know from that circumstance. So this is a snapshot of where we've been and then how all these pieces fit 
into your time with your client. So start understanding how each of these skills that we've been covering thus far in this course play into that whole scheme and that whole progression of work with your clients. We're not done yet. There are a few more skills that we will address and a few more pieces to the process that we'll, we'll plug in later. But I did want to just take a pause, give you the perspective again of where this all fits in so that way you have that understanding that is increasing on what happens where and why does it happen in that progression and why is it helped for your understanding as you work with your clients. That's all for this lecture. I hope you continue to work on your skills, keep practicing, and makes it permanent, and work on exceptions and scaling, and we'll see you next time.